Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Eating Disorder Hope webinar presentation on neurobiology and eating disorders. We are delighted to feature our guest presenter, Dr. Walter Kay, founder and executive director of the UCSD Eating Disorder Center for Treatment and Research. We are also joined tonight by Dr. Aaron Parks, director of outreach and admissions. As a reminder, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the question pane of your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Walter Kay. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate uh, being invited. I'm delighted to do this, and uh, let me go ahead and get started and uh, tell you why I'm uh, you know, using this kind of approach. And the bottom line is there's really limited efficacy of current treatments, and I, th I think you know that. There really are no proven treatments that really reverse core symptoms of people with anorexia um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by core symptoms. And part of the, and you know, consequently, people often have a very kind of prolonged course, but you know, many people do get better. Um, but we lack a mechanistic understanding of you know neurobiologic contributions, and that's what we're trying to develop. So as you're very, you're well that there are a lot of puzzling symptoms that occur in people with. Uh, with eating disorders and anorexia, you know, this is a fairly uh, narrow range of symptoms compared to other behavioral disorders. It has its onset during adolescence and puberty most of the time, and it's, it's highly female. And people, of course, develop severe restricted eating and emaciation. And, you know, we really don't have a good understanding of why those symptoms developed. There's a lot of hypotheses out there, but there's really relatively little data. And some people develop overeating and compensatory, other you know, compensatory behaviors for that. Uh, people often but not always have body image distortions, fear of being fat. Uh, and people tend to have a certain temperament. Um, and uh, people tend to be perfectionistic, anxious, inhibited, uh, you know, have altered sensitivity to reward. And when people are ill with anorexia, the thing that makes it such a hard illness to treat and probably contributes to the high death rate is that often people have don't see themselves as having a problem and they're very resistant to treatment. And there are, as I mentioned, there are treatments that reverse core symptoms. We have no medication or no proven psychotherapies that really are very powerful. Now, what happens to people with, with anorexia nervosa? Well, actually, about 50% of people recover. And one of the things that we and other investigators have noted, just like there's a set of anorexia in teenage years, there tends to be an offset that people tend to get better in their late teens to mid 20s uh, when they recover, uh, but they may be ill for for many years before that happens. Um, and and not everybody recovers. About 30% of people, more or less, remain chronically ill, and this has a, a perhaps the highest death rate of any behavioral disorder, with five or 10% or more people dying from from anorexia. Now, the conventional notion of eating disorders is that these are psychosocial illnesses, and clearly eating and body image are important to all of us and something that we in the media pay a lot of attention to. But anorexia really predates this current culture. This is a description of somebody more than 300 years ago in England that, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but most likely she had anorexia nervosa, um, and I, I won't bother reading this, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's likely that this is a, a disorder that's been around for a long time. So many women died in this culture, but really very few people, relatively speaking, develop anorexia and bulimia. You know, it's, a, it's, it's you know, one, two, three percent of women. And you would think that if it was just culture and society, 
uh, or parenting or things like that, the incidence of eating disorders would be much higher. And, and they're not. And this raises the question about whether there are susceptibility factors that make some women vulnerable to dieting or weight loss. So we, over the last couple of decades, we've developed a new understanding of eating disorders. Uh, family studies have shown that eating disorders um, run in families. Not every family, but uh, you know, if you have an eating disorder, you're more likely to have someone in your family or more distant family uh, also have uh, an eating disorder. So somebody with anorexia can actually have somebody with bulimia in their family. Um, but that doesn't really answer the question about whether it's learned or whether it's uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, genetic or heritable. But there is a way of trying to tease that apart, and that's looking at identical versus non-identical twins. And from that, for very complicated kind of reasons, you can kind of estimate how much of this might be environmental, and by that we mean kind of learned, and how much of this might be related to heredity, you know, uh, like genes. And over and over again, these studies have shown that uh, uh, roughly 50 to 80 percent of the reason that people develop eating disorders is related to heritable risk. And what this says is, is genes are more powerful than culture. Now, we don't really, we have not found genes that cause eating disorders, and for that matter, we really haven't found genes that cause other behavioral disorders. That's kind of another discussion, but something I happen to answer some questions on. But what we think uh, genes may contribute to are these susceptibility factors that put people at risk. And as it turns out, these genes may contribute to certain traits that occur in childhood in many people that develop an eating disorder. And this may be the powerful neurobiologic contri contribution to a risk for eating disorder. So, so what are some of these risk factors? Now, when I, when I talk to people and the studies that have been done, you know, identify that as children, before anybody ever develops an eating disorder, people tend to have certain kinds of temperament and personality. It's not like everybody has exactly the same temperaments and personality. It's, it's more like a menu. And people may have one of this, one of those, and people have different patterns. So for those of you who may have had or have eating disorders that are in the audience or know somebody, uh, let me just answer, answer this yourself. You know, as a child, before you ever developed the eating disorder, were you perfectionistic? Things had to be done a certain way. You were very uncomfortable if, if it wasn't. People who develop eating disorders tend to be kind of achievement-oriented. They often want to do very well in school, get all A's. They, some of them can be obsessional, and when they're obsessional, they tend to ha often have certain kind of symptoms, uh, symmetry, exactness. Things have to be done a certain way, you know, where everything is on your desk. You line up your clothes in certain ways in your closet. Not everybody, but, you know, that's, that's a common presentation. As children, people tend to be sensitive to criticism and punishment and, and mistakes. They tend to be anxious. They worry about what might happen. They worry about consequences. Uh, they can be harm avoidant. Uh, uh, they're risk avoidant. They can have difficulty with uncertainty or novelty or change or social situation. Uh, sometimes they're, they can be kind of inflexible and rule-bound, and some people are, can actually be kind of the opposite of this, can be kind of impulsive and overreactive and, and emotional. Now, as I said, it's not like everybody has all these symptoms. People do develop eating disorders and don't have any of these, but we tend to find people have one or more of these uh, as, as children uh, years before they develop an eating disorder. So what would be the link between these kind of childhood traits and developing, an, you know, restricting or binging or purging kind of eating behaviors? How does that make sense? Well, before I kind of talk about that, let me make one other point here. And that is that, you know, it's very difficult for most people to starve themselves and lose weight. So on your left-hand side is a study I just picked out of the literature um, on uh, kind of a typical dietary study in obese women. And this is a study that compared uh, behavioral therapy to diet alone to the combination. 
And what you see here is, and these are women that weigh a couple hundred pounds, um, what you see is in the short run, at the end of treatment, they lost weight. But if you follow people out for five years, what you find the recidivism rate with obesity is very high. And we know that. We know that it's very, you know, diets don't work very well in obesity and uh, and people, uh, you, you know, are trying other kinds of things like bariatric surgery, which seems to be uh, more successful, at least for some people. And what's, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, different about people with anorexia nervosa is this is a group of people that can eat, you know, a relatively small amount of food every day for, you know, many years and basically starve themselves to death. Now, there are powerful homeostatic mechanisms in the brain that make it very difficult for people to not eat. And just as, you know, you can't really hold, you know, your breath and die from, uh, you know, not breathing or if you don't drink water, you, know, you develop a very powerful thirst. You know, there's similar kind of mechanisms for, for food that kick in and and drive eating behavior. So the question that we've been very curious about is why, is, you know, what happens to people with anorexia? Why don't these homeostatic mechanisms kick in? And, uh, and and drive eating behavior. So what happens when most people get hungry? Well, you know, I, I, I sit down and do kind of similar sessions with, you know, families and their children with eating disorders all the time, and I'll ask the family members that don't have an eating disorder and uh, what happens if they go without eating for a couple of days, and people invariably say the same thing. They say they get irritable, they get tense when hungry, uh, it's an unpleasant situation, and that food, you get hungry enough, food becomes uh, more pleasurable and rewarding, uh, at least, you know, the first couple of bites of it. Uh, it may taste good after that, but, you know, it, it becomes more pleasurable. And for people with anorexia, you know, for many people, they'll report that there's something about food or thinking about food that makes them anxious. It's not, it's not pleasurable, and there, there's something about not eating that maybe it doesn't take the anxiety away, maybe it reduces it a bit, but it, it, uh, you, you know, it doesn't make them more anxious. They feel better if they don't eat. So this, the, this is, you know, kind of exactly the opposite kind of uh, behaviors. And also, I'm not going to talk really about bulimia tonight, just because of time, but we see some relationships also to kind of emotions and mood states. And uh, in in uh, bulimia too, it's a little bit different. Uh, actually, people with bulimia, actually, mo many people with bulimia alternate between restricted eating and overeating, and they'll often tell you that stress or negative mood states or uh, being upset uh, triggers binge purge uh, episodes. So there's this relationship between mood states and, and eating behavior. Now, the f one of the first things I want to say is that um, the way we've understood behavior up to now has been uh, isn't very much connected with how the brain works. I mean, we when I when I talk to another professional, I say somebody has anorexia or bulimia or depression. That's kind of a shorthand for saying there's a cluster of symptoms that go together. And instead of describing all the symptoms, you know, if I say somebody has anorexia, somebody else knows kind of what I'm talking about. Um, and but these are syndromes. It doesn't actually have a lot to do with how the brain is really wired. We there is no brain centers you can knock out to cause anorexia, and so we're starting to have a new understanding of how behavior is encoded in the brain, and it's going to be very different than the way we think of it now. And we're trying to understand how these circuits function in eating disorders. Because ultimately, behavior is wired into molecules in the brain. And so, you know, how, exactly how can you wire behavior into some molecule? And how can we use this to develop better treatments? Now, some of the constructs, I'm not going to go into a lot, but the ways we're starting to think of eating disorders is, for example, there's, uh, for one thing, why is this important? Because actually there's data suggesting that the more anxious people are, uh, the worst they may do, the poor outcomes they have. And so we're trying to develop treatments to reduce and manage anxiety as a way of improving outcome. 
So we're looking at constructs, and I'm going to talk tonight about anxiety and inhibition versus reward and motivation and how that works in the brain. Uh, and there's a pretty uh, substantial replicated literature suggesting that people with both anorexia and bulimia are, are what we call highly punishment sensitive. They're, they're sensitive to making errors, mistakes, loss. Uh, and they're very kind of sensitive to any kind of criticism or making, you know, doing something wrong. Um, and that's what we mean by high punishment sensitive. People with anorexia have low kind of response and sensitivity to reward, where people with bulimia may be very overreactive to reward. That So that may be one of the things that differentiates people who develop anorexia or bulimia. Um, people with both anorexia tend to be harm avoidant. Uh, which is a construct uh, uh, of kind of anxiety and inhibition and inflexibility. They tend to be overconcerned with consequences. Uh, e even people who believe me have exaggerated inhibition sometimes. They tend to be in intolerance of uncertainty and change, uh, perfectionism, over sensitive to errors. And uh, a little something I'm going to talk about to some extent is self awareness of body state. That's, that's a construct called kind of interception, and and they may people with eating disorders may be kind of over under sensitive to kind of their body states, and you know whether these are different constructs or different sides of the same coin isn't very clear. But let me talk a little bit more about this. So let's raise the question about whether people who have an eating disorder actually have an alteration of systems of the brain that are important for food and weight regulation. And if we're going to kind of consider this, the question you have to ask, well, where in the brain the body might this occur? You know, food regulation and weight is a complex system. It involves uh, uh, metabolic and other kinds of signals from your gut and uh, uh, endocrine tissue in your body and um, other kinds of systems. Um, but there hasn't been really evidence suggesting that these that it's something in the periphery, and we've been very interested in particularly looking at the brain. Now, in the brain, you're probably most familiar with the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is a part of the brain that's very important for kind of energy balance. And what it does is it kind of informs you about energy stores in the body. So uh, hormones that get released in the body, such as insulin and leptin, are very important for kind of telling the brain about energy stores, sugar and fat, and how much you have in your body. But again, there isn't really evidence suggesting that there's, a, there's something happening in the hypothalamus. Now, we've been interested in higher brain circuits that may be involved. And you may ask yourself the question, like, where is this coming from? Well, the problem that we had in research is that up to maybe the last 10 or 15 years ago, we haven't had good methods of looking inside the brain of people who are alive and, and, and functioning. So as opposed to being able to get a blood sample or you know, get some tissue from the body, you can't really do that in the brain. You can't, you know, you can't really, it's inside the skull. There's no way to kind of take a look inside the brain until now. But over the last decade or so, technology has been developed, particularly brain imaging, that allows us to safely look inside the brain of people and begin to ask questions about brain circuits that may be important. And what we've learned is that, in fact, there are brain circuits that are very important for food and appetite uh, regulation. And there's systems in the brain that are very important for kind of driving the pleasure and motivation to eat. And that tends to be uh, an area called the limbic system and frontal lobes and, um, and some related kind of systems. And there's also systems in the body, other parts of the frontal lobe and other parts of the brain that are very important for kind of cognitive control and inhibition. So we're beginning to learn more about these higher, higher cortical centers that are actually very important for kind of driving um, and, and regulating appetite behavior. Now, it turns out that these things, these systems that are very important for pleasure and motivation and cognitive control are exactly the same systems in the brain that are important for mood regulation and, and impulse control. So it's no wonder that there's some overlap between 
uh, eating behavior and and mood and self con impulse control because you're really dealing with with the same system in the brain. So simply putting, we've been very interested in the concept of whether uh, altered eating in people with eating disorders is is related to some kind of imbalance between reward and inhibition. To put it simply, is is there either too little reward from food or too much reward from food, uh, you know, so the anorexics have too little reward, people with bulimia too much reward from food, and and or is there something altered in inhibition to people with anorexia have too much inhibition, people with bulimia have too little inhibition. And this is something that we can test. So we can, we can develop um, tasks that test these kind of things and and we can measure these circuits in the brain. So what about people with anorexia? Well, the things that appeal to most teenage kids, and you know, this is a little facetious, of course, but foods, drugs, sex, rock and roll tend to be less important for people with anorexia. And there actually seems to be some, you know, clinical, you know, alteration in the balance between, uh, in, you know, things like reward and immediate gratification and long-term consequences, inhibition and self-control. With you know reduced kind of reward and immediate gratification and increased kind of inhibition self control, so some of the data supporting this is it's been known for a long time that people with anorexia tend to be a bit anhedonic. That is, they there isn't much in life that's rewarding to them aside from you know starvation. And there's other studies suggesting that they're they're insensitive to reward. Um, and there's there's other data that suggests people with anorexia, you know, pay more attention to long-term consequences and have increased self-control. So one of the studies you can do is you can offer people a choice between reward now or reward in the future. Would you prefer $10 now or $12 in a year? And most people would prefer the $10 now. Uh, but people with anorexia are one of the few groups of people that actually can delay gratification and would prefer a later, later larger reward. And they tend to be harm avoiding and sensitive to punishment, which may be a reflection of this kind of inhibition and 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 self control and not wanting to make mistakes. So we we've been I'm going to talk about kind of the systems that are important for kind of immediate reward and the rewarding aspects of food. And one of the things that we know in and this goes along with what I've been telling you about people that don't have an eating disorder or animals, uh, when they get hungry, it increases the motivational aspect of not only food, but other things like money or drugs. So, and when you do the imaging studies on animals or humans uh, or other kinds of studies, what you find is when they get hungry, it activates regions associated with rewards or reduces uh, uh, you know, inhibitory self-control. Well, that, that kind of makes perfect sense here, doesn't it? And when hungry, you know, some of the evidence is that healthy humans are less risk aversive. And actually, we've known for a long time when animals are hungry, they'll use more drugs. And my mother always used to say, don't go shopping when you're hungry because you'll buy things you wouldn't buy otherwise. So the question is, what happens in people with anorexia nervosa? So what, the study that we're, I'm going to tell you about is... Uh, uh, we had people with anorexia lay in, in a scanner and we gave them repeated taste of sugar through a tube in their mouth. The sugar was um, dissolved in water. And we, and we know that, and I'm going to show you the circuit that we were testing. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to see whether, how, how people's reward center uh, responded to taste of sugar. And what we're using here is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. And let me, kind of explaining a complicated technology, very kind of oversimplified. So uh, what this does is powerful magnetic fields, and it measures, there's iron in your red blood cells, and when you have, uh, when, the, uh, when there's oxygen combined with the iron, it has a different kind of conformational state than without oxygen. And so what this does is it allows us to measure blood flow and oxygen use in tissues in the brain. Now, when you move your arm and you move the muscles in your arm, the muscle cells, you know, start to work, and there's a whole machinery inside the muscle cells, and for that muscle cell to work, it's got to burn energy. Um, and so 
uh, it gets more blood flow and it uses more oxygen. And actually, the same thing happens in neurons in the brain. When you activate them with a task, in this case, tasting sugar, um, they burn, they work hard, the cells that are responsible for processing that work harder, they, they need energy, so they get more blood flow and they burn uh, uh, oxygen. So this is a way of kind of telling us what parts of the brain get activated and if there's differences between people with anorexia and, and uh, the control women in this circuit. So uh, very simply, uh, I'm not going to describe the whole experiment. Uh, we've published this in the American Journal a couple years ago. Uh, uh, but what we did is we gave we had people lay in a scanner, we had a tube going in their mouth, and we gave them repeated taste of, of sugar uh, water. And and every time we gave them a taste of sugar water, we kind of we measure uh, the activity of their brain. Now, the circuit that why did we do this? Well, for one thing, we know a lot more about pathways that regulate hunger than we do in terms of pathways that regulate mood. Um, and so we, we really under, you know, much better understand uh, you know, hunger. So when you taste sugar, what happens is the sweet taste receptors in your tongue, the sugar molecule just fits into that receptor like a key into a lock. It activates the sweet taste receptor, which just sends a signal down through your tongue into your brainstem, into the part of the brain called the thalamus. It just says you've tasted something sweet. And what it does is it goes to the area of the brain called the insula. And the insula is, is very important. I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's the primary taste cortex. It just basically, your brain, is, when it gets activated, it just says you have tasted something sweet. But parts of the insula, are very, other parts of the insula are very important for kind of integrating, you know, your, your emotional state you're in and also the message about whether you're hungry or full. Uh, because the insula is very important for kind of being self-aware of body states. And there's other parts of the brain that it works with. So you'll see over on the left here, tongue tastes sugar, the insula recognizes taste and integrates that with how hungry and satiate or full you are. The frontal parts of the frontal lobe kind of tell you about the valuation of that. The amygdala tells you about kind of the emotional relevance. And it goes to a part of the brain called the ventral striatum. So um, this is part of the limbic system and right here, is uh, is the ventral striatum here. It's part of the brain that's very important for kind of not only reward, but actually motivating and carrying out behavior. And it's this striatum that's very important for kind of getting us to uh, approach food and 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 eat food. Um, and so this so this is a circuit where we can you know, transform kind of taste of sugar into a signal about hunger and satiety and approach or avoidance of food. And so this is where the insula is. It's this part of the brain that's very deep to the temporal lobe here. Um, it's kind of, this is the frontal lobe here. Your eyes would be down here. And these are different parts of the insula. And part of this, the insula here is self-awareness of body states. If you have to urinate, if you have a pain in your stomach, uh, the insula is part of the brain that tells you there's something going on there. You better do something about it. And part of it's the primary taste cortex, and it signals changes in body states. And uh, we call this a salient part of a salient circuit. It, it evalu evaluates the salience of these kind of stimuli, pain, taste, fullness, and integrates it with cues about motivation and emotional processes and gets you to carry out something. So whether it's you know, eating or urinating or whatever, you know, the insula is, is telling you, you know, you better do something about it. And this is the part of the brain that's called the reward, that I talked about the reward area, which I'm going to, I'm just going to show you the data on these two areas. This is a part of the brain that's very deep in the striatum here. Here's your brain. And this is a primitive part of the brain that we share with other, you know, uh, more primitive animals. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, there's a lot of evidence showing that this is kind of a, a reward center is kind of a simple way of, of, of uh, describing it. it. It's really a center that's very important for kind of motivation and, and responding to rewards and anticipating rewards too. So who do we study? Well, the first thing is we actually studied people who were recovered from restricting type anorexia. And the reason that we did that was because 
um, we were concerned that people were very starved and malnourished. There would be disturbances of the reward circuit um, just because they were so starved. So we wanted to look at people who recover from anorexia. We think that this may be a trait in the vulnerability that you know uh, persists, and I'll talk more about that. So these are people who are normal weight, nutrition, menses, not on medication. Uh, and so you, this group was, they were in their mid-20s, they were normal BMI, the CW is the control women, this is a recovery anorexic. And you can see that, just like I mentioned before, people who are recovered still tend to be have mild elevations of this construct of harm avoidance, kind of anxiety inhibition. Um, so this is the finding. And there, so this is the insula, and these are parts of the striatum that we looked at, um, the ventral striatum and another part of the striatum that's very important, the dorsal caudate. I won't talk too much about the deep difference between these. And what you see is that people with anorexia had a very reduced response in these areas, the taste of sugar, compared to um, uh, the healthy controls. And um, th we've actually seen this now three in, in two other studies. Um, so we've replicated this pretty much exactly the same now three times um, in different scanners in different institutes, making us think that this is this is pretty real. And what this suggests to us is there's something about the reward or the approach of food that seems to be diminished in people who have recovered from who have anorexia and even after recovery from anorexia. Um, and that, uh, you know, this may start to really explain why so, how somebody can starve themselves and eat a few hundred calories a day for many years if they simply just don't have the drive to eat. The food just isn't, isn't rewarding. Um, you know, I, I'll say one thing because I think this is a question that comes up. Uh, people with anorexia actually can taste, you seem to taste sweetness fine and they actually know that they're hungry, it may not be that the signal is, the problem is there. It may be this, the problem is actually translating that signal into actually carrying out an act, you know, uh, motivation or, or re, uh, responding to reward. So there may be something within the circuit that is different, but part of the circuit works okay. So... Let me just mention one other thing is that we have found, and this, actually this is about five or six times, but if you start to know, in this circuit that I talked about in the striatum, a very important transmitter is called dopamine. And dopamine is actually very important for kind of reward and motivation. And one of the things that we've seen is that we have another imaging study that allows us to measure uh, dopamine levels in the brain uh, particularly in response to uh, one of the receptors, the dopamine D2 receptor. And we see that actually people with anorexia seem to have increased dopamine receptor activity, and it's correlated actually with how anxious or harm avoidant they are. So the more anxious or harm avoidant they are, the more they, uh, more activity they have, uh, more binding of this D2 receptor. And I'll come back to why that's important. So... What does this part of the brain do? Well, you know, this is an important part of the brain for learning and reward. And it's, it's, and actually, you know, human beings and animals uh, learn from reward and punishment. That's actually a critical part of life. And, um, you know, it's very simple. If something is rewarding, you learn to do it more. If something is aversive, you learn to do it less. And it's this system in the brain in the striatum that's very critical for a kind of encoding that kind of behavior in the brain. And, you know, there may be a bias in the temperament in people with anorexia where there's diminished reward and increased kind of uh, sensitivity to kind of adversity or, or punishment. And, it, you know, one of the ways it kind of shows itself is, is a, a type of anxiety. And it may be that uh, we have other studies which uh, were uh, in the middle of uh, trying, uh, publishing uh, that I can't kind of present today, but we actually see that uh, anxious, behavior, you know, the more anxious people are, it actually directly inhibits motivation and, and reward uh, in this part of the brain. 
So, uh, you know, I've been talking about this part of the brain as being important for reward, but actually it's very important for both reward and inhibition. And uh, in terms of, and this gets a little bit complicated, but in this part of the brain, there's actually one system called the direct pathway that's very important for kind of promoting action and like approaching food and another pathway called the indirect pathway that's important for suppressing action and inhibiting food. And, and um, what we think is going on is that uh, because of this evidence that uh, anxiety and harm avoidance is related to how much D2 receptor activity there are is that we think that there may be too much D2 activity and too little B1 activity and this is kind of producing this uh, inhibition and, uh, and related to this reduced uh, reward. And, and so let me explain exactly what that means. So, you know, if you're a rabbit living out in a field, um, you know, and you, you're living in your den here, it's probably relatively safe and, you, you know, if you stay in there, uh, you're, you're going to be safe, but as you start to get more hungry, your, your brain is going to motivate you to go out and look for food. You're going to go ahead and do that. But you know, for a rabbit and for our ancestors, food was risky, and that there could be a fox out there that might eat you. And so you have to have a system in your brain that's very important. You know, even though you may be very hungry and very motivated to eat, you need to have a system that actually inhibits that motivation in, in a risky kind of situation. And, uh, you know, if, you know, the rabbits that do that well stay alive and they pass their genes on to their offspring. If you're a rabbit and you're not really paying attention to risk, you get eaten by the fox and you're out of the gene pool so you don't pass those genes on. And what we think may be going on with people with anorexia is they may be getting a a actually a signal about food that there's something about it that's aversive and and even kind of dangerous and risky and it doesn't make any sense uh to other people and it probably doesn't even make sense to people with anorexia because you know the brain is kind of telling them that there's something uh, you know risky about food um it's not it's not rewarding it's not driving motivation so is there a benefit? Well, you know, I look at this as kind of an enhanced alarm uh, system, and our ancestors lived in a dangerous world, and this is a bias sensitivity of, of uh, risk is uh, uh, outweighs reward. And this is uh, these are people that have increased anticipation of danger or error. You know, they, they have repertoire of alternative plans. What if something happens? Uh, they're persistent, they pay attention to detail, they pay attention to change and uncertainty. You know, Mother Nature doesn't really care if you're happy. It cares if you stay alive and you pass these genes on. And so there, there really, I think, is a benefit for, for this. And in fact, what we find is that when people recover from eating disorders, both anorexia and bulimia, they actually do very well in life. And some of these traits, these temperaments that get them into into trouble actually may be very kind of beneficial uh, in certain in certain ways, uh, particularly in certain professions. Uh, this is achievement oriented, attention to detail, concerns about consequences, self discipline. Uh, you know, you do very well in life if you're in engineering or medicine or research or law or something like that. That really pay that really rewards these. But you know. These are traits that may not go away, but people who recover may find ways to use these um, in, in more uh, uh, adaptive kinds of ways. And, and I think that's very important because that's starting to give us clues about how to kind of uh, improve treatment for people with anorexia. How can they use these traits uh, constructively rather than destructively? So, you know, in terms of a practical approach to treating temperament, you can't change it. It's really unlikely. Uh, the kind of things I do with psychoeducation they really aren't very helpful to kids who are ill with anorexia. It doesn't, you know, make them feel any better. It's helpful for the parents and it helps us structure the environment for family-based treatment or, or you know, monthly family-based kinds of treatment uh, and understand uh, what their kids' eating disorders are going through and, and develop strategies. 
and whether we can actually develop ways to modify or adapt it with medication or as I've talked about skills-based constructive coping strategies is, is really the question now. So we've actually designed a temperament-based therapy for eating disorders. We published a paper um, in the European Eating Disorder Review that kind of talks about this. And we've added this to our family-based treatment, uh, and it's designed to teach uh, people with anorexia and their, and their significant others to recognize the temperament patterns and develop adequate uh, coping and management strategies. Uh, we're doing this in collaboration with Ivan Eisler, who is actually the principal architect of FBT. And we we're also adapting this to uh, to adults uh, with anorexia and their carers. And it's this two-pronged approach. We teach people with anorexia constructive coping skills, and we teach uh, their carer skills to manage anorexia temperament. And we've the first things that we've kind of targeted are anticipatory anxiety, reward and cognitive control, and, and meal behavior. And um, so this is you know, just to kind of give you a very simple overview of this. For anticipatory anxiety, uh, for the family, uh, you know, high structure, reducing uncertainty and change, uh, you know, we think is useful. And for people with, with eating disorders, you know, uh, learning ways to tolerate it and, and uh, you know, some exception, acceptive kind of therapies, uh, you know, is one, is one kind of approach. And I'll come back to that a little bit. Um, the other thing is this kind of balance between reward and punishment. You know, rewards don't work very well for, for kids with anorexia, you know, in terms of getting into eating, gaining weight. And so uh, we've been working with families in terms of contingent management, how you can not punish people with anorexia by using, uh, you know, consequences, but how the whole the family can kind of sit down and work together and, uh, and construct kind of a contract that kind of says, look, you know, rewards or maybe very some very specific rewards might be useful, but let's let's look at the consequences. And if you don't eat and maintain your weight, what are the consequences going to be? Let's agree on that, and let's have some concrete kind of rules. And uh, and you know, if, if that doesn't work, uh, you know, you'll have to suffer the consequences, like going back into in, into treatment. What about anxiety? You know, anxiety is a tough one. By its very nature, it's wired to get our attention. It's very hard to really just kind of tolerate it. Uh, we've been trying to, um, uh, you know, this kind of, but only, you know, a couple of different kinds of things you can do. You can either manage it or tolerate it, or you can try and reduce it by medication. Um, for some people, uh, you know, the benzodiazepines don't seem to be very useful. For some people, we find some low doses of certain of the what we call atypical anti uh, um, uh, antipsychotics reduce anxiety, but it doesn't work in everybody. Um, and it's not because we think people are psychotic; it's just that it actually happens to block the dopamine D2 receptor, uh, and it works for some people but not others. It, and it tends to act if it's going to work very quickly, and it may be potentiated by you know antidepressants. Uh, I'm just going to end here by just talking about uh, a couple of our treatment approaches because I look at our so we have a, a very large treatment program, but I look at ourselves as also um, a treatment laboratory where we're trying to develop more effective kinds of treatment. So one of our treatments that we have is for people uh, that live out of town. We have an intensive family therapy. Uh, it's a five-day intensive multifamily treatment where we have three to five families at a time come in. It tends to be um, usually uh, young adolescents to adolescents with eating disorders in their families. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's a separate pro we have separate programs for adolescents and adults. And, um, and so we use this multifamily group approach that uh, Ivan Eisler has pilot piloted. Uh, where we teach the adolescent skills training and the parents' management uh, skills training. And uh, together, we, they work on being contracting. But it's much more complicated than that. Uh, this is actually the IFT schedule. I think you have copies of the slides, so you can look at it. But it's, it's actually 35 to 40 hours of very intense kind of, uh, of treatments with uh, uh, multifamily meals and uh, and, uh, you know, we've actually done a 30-month uh, outcome study uh, of the first 
um, uh, you know, uh, participants in this, and what we saw over 30 months is that about 60% had a full remission and 20% had a partial remission. So there's some data actually that this is an effective uh, approach, and we, we treat a lot of people that have failed in other programs. Other innovative approaches, um, we, we use a partial hospitalization rather than residential inpatient. Um, it's, it's the adolescent program, to some extent the adult program is very uh, family-based services uh, with uh, families meeting two nights a week and all day Sunday. Uh, but you know, of course people live at home and family meal is the core approach. We also have separate programs for uh, uh, bulimia nervosa and particularly adults with bulimia or uh, uh, who often have dysregulated behaviors, uh, poor you know, problems with impulse control, drugs and alcohol. Uh, this is particularly uh, focused on using dialectic behavioral therapy for learning emotional regulation and distress tolerance. We have a PTSD trauma track. We have co-recurring substance abuse tracks. And uh, we're, we're looking at new medications like Lamictal, which we're seeing some success in improving uh, mood and impulse control. Um, and we also have a, a, a family-based program, a separate family-based program for children with avoiding restrictive food intake disorder uh, and an inpatient medical stability unit at Radies Children's Hospital. So we actually have this continuum of, of, of care model. People can enter basically any, any spot on that. Uh, and the inpatient is at Radies Children's Hospital. The partial hospitalization is, uh, is in San Diego. Um, and people can attend 10 hours a day, six hours a day, or uh, you know three hours a day, um, up to six days a week, or as little as three days a week, depending on what they need. And and it's a very intensive treatment program. Uh, and we we basically have three separate programs for children, for adolescents, and adults. We don't mix them. So in summary, you know, other areas of mental health have been aggressively applying new insights from neuroscience to treatment. We, we've actually kind of lagged behind that. And, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm feeling optimistic now that we're, we're starting to really uh, understand these uh, disorders and, and develop more effective approaches. There are a lot of things that we don't understand very well that we particularly need to kind of focus on our body image disturbances, but we're developing some new insights into uh, the, you know, the brain structures underlying that, uh, things like lack of insight or resistance, uh, what happens to brain development over the course of time, and how uh, puberty or early adolescence may actually contribute to uh, uh, risk of developing these disorders. So um, Dr. Parks is also on the phone, and I'll ask her to uh, also uh, respond to any kind of questions you have. But we we offer we only have really one program in San Diego, but we offer a uh, uh, free two-hour assessment and, uh, um, and consultation, and we also send out speakers to clinics and uh, uh, you know and other kinds of uh, you know events and. Uh, and uh, you know we're 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 accessible and available for people that are looking for help. So I think that's probably the last. I just want to mention um, this, uh, the people that have uh, contributed to uh, the brain imaging studies that I told you about, particularly uh, Tyson and Guido Frank and Angela Wagner um, and Christine Wairega and uh, Ursula Baylor and uh, Alice Ely. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. K, for your excellent presentation. And we will now be transitioning into the Q&A portion of our presentation for this evening. And as a reminder, you can still submit questions to the question pane in your attendee control panel. So I'm um, Dr. K and Dr. Parks. Our first question submitted is, um, what treatment focus would you recommend for single adults without family involvement are outcomes poor for uh, older adults with anorexia? Uh, yeah, let me ask Dr. Parks, who's an expert on this. To, you know, I want you to meet her too to chime in. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to answer this question? Yeah, I would. Thank you very much. And thanks for taking the time to write in a question. 
Um, in our adult clinic, we are really proud that it's not just a young college student clinic. So we have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s all in our clinic. And you are correct that it sometimes can be um, a longer course of treatment for someone who has had the illness for longer, um, which is often common when people are adults. And additionally, by adulthood, sometimes people are experiencing comorbidities, like difficulties with substance use, trauma, depression, anxiety. Um, so we do have people that spend a longer time working on their recovery and going through treatment when they're an adult. Different adults have taken different approaches. So we've had um, some adults who have a partner or a spouse or an aunt or a best friend who ends up playing a large role in treatment. Um, they help to keep them accountable. They come to our carers groups and our family, um, our family days, and they help to provide that structure and reduce the uncertainty that Dr. K was speaking of. Um, some of our younger adults might have parents who are really involved, but we've also had adults in their 30s and even 40s that have had a large amount of parent involvement as well. Um, so as far as I think your specific question was what type of treatment approach would you suggest, um, we're using dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, from Marsha Linehan for our adult that provides a structure of our adult clinic. And we find that uh, the distress tolerance and emotion regulation skills that DBT provides um, helps to provide that structure and reduce some uncertainty that Dr. K was speaking of. So I hope that answered some of your question. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Parks. And our next question um, is asking, what are benefits of the PHP level of care rather than residential treatment? Oh, I would love to answer that question. That's a really great question, and I think that's something that us as treatment providers have not done a good enough job of explaining to the public what the difference is between these levels of care. Um, at the residential level of care, you, that's someplace where you would spend the night. So you would spend uh, 24 hours a day there, usually for 30 to 60 days. Um, at the PHP level of care, you're going home every night. For our adults in treatment, sometimes that's going to their home with roommates or their uh, home college or home with parents. For others, that might be living in our supportive housing. The reason why, um, there's a couple big differences between the PHP and residential level of care. First, it's important to note that we can take the same symptomology in both levels. So if you are a fit for residential, then I'd say about 90% of people would also do quite well in a 10-hour PHP. The benefit um, in our program of our PHP 10 is that people get to keep a foot uh, in the real world. So when people leave our clinic at 7 p.m. for the adults or 6.30 for the teens and kids, they get together with their friends, they do things with their family, a lot of them go and volunteer, some are participating in school. And all of these things um, have stressors and we want people to go and engage with their life and experience stressors. Consistent with the DBT model though, every patient in our clinic has their therapist's cell phone number. So we want you on a Sunday when there's no program or an evening to be maybe out for your grandfather's 65th birthday or maybe you're out with friends celebrating something and we want you to be challenged and to go into the bathroom or go find a quiet place and to text your therapist and say, I'm having an urge to restrict or I'm having an urge to binge. And your therapist will then provide what we call skills coaching will ask, what skill have you been working on in clinic that you think will help you right now, and how can I coach you through using that skill? So that's one huge benefit of being in PHP 10, is that you are continuing to build that life worth living outside of the eating disorder. I'll add one more benefit. Um, PHP 10, the way it's structured with us, is that we're providing 10 hours a day of very active treatment. Um, sometimes treatment can be um, a respite from the real world, and there is some benefit to that. Um, and some treatment centers might provide more of a passive supervision model. So what they're able to do is provide you with 24 hours a day of supervision. At the PHP 10 level, it's very, very active treatment. Um, I know that everyone that leaves at the end of the day is pretty exhausted because they are working hard and they're in evidence-based treatment groups for the entire 10 hours. So it's a less of a supervision approach and much more of an active treatment approach. So those are two differences. I hope that helps to answer the question. Yeah, I like to look at our program as kind of a school for emotions. And, you know, it's it's really kind of a, you know, a, 
you know, it's like it basically, you know, where else do you kind of kind of go to really kind of get the, you know, that kind of instruction? Great. Thank you both so much. And um, we have just a couple more questions. Um, one of our attendees is asking, with anorexia, is the reward not the control itself, the perfectionism itself, as opposed to the reward of food, taste, and safety? satiation. It seems to me the anorexic person is highly motivated to be rewarded by these goals. Any thoughts on that? You know, you know, reward is kind of a way, you know, kind of like pain in a way or, you know, any other kind of sensation. And um, my definition of reward may be different than other people's definition of reward, just like, you know, it's hard, you know, people, you'll respond very differently to kind of pain or have different kind of, you know, you know how do you know what somebody else is really feeling when it comes to pain? Um, so, you know, I think that this is one of the complexities of, of this is kind of using these terms and actually reward is, you know, probably very much of an oversimplification anyway in terms of what we're really trying to kind of get at here. It's, um, you know, is it really kind of reward? Is it really kind of a reduction of anxiety? You know, I, I, this is this is confusing because we're trying to translate, you know, symptoms into kind of these neurobiologic kinds of uh, uh, constructs, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I want to, if I can piggyback on that, Dr. K, and add one thing. Um, using DBT as our framework, a large part of it is learning how to recognize and label our emotions, because as Dr. K said, it can be different for different people. And what, the emotion that a lot of people, I hear a lot of people using is pride. They might feel some pride when they have um, successfully engaged in an eating disorder behavior, um, and sometimes people will thinking semantically, think of that pride as a reward, um, whereas when they describe getting an actual reward, like for instance, um, getting an A on a test, they feel like they have pride and that gets paired maybe with happiness, um, as opposed to when they are successful with the eating sort of behavior, they might have pride without the happiness they'll sometimes describe. But it's a very complex set of, of emotions and I think our language sometimes gets in the way. Great, thank you. And another attendee is asking, at one year past hospitals, hospitalization yeah. and full weight restoration, my daughter is not able to eat intuitively. Our team supports continued plating with ongoing challenges, but this seems to be the minority approach in the field. Given that your research shows that the brain may take two years to fully recover from malnutrition, it seems like continued meal support is a more likely path to full healing. Do you agree with this? At what point do you recommend that patients have full responsibility for their own intake? You know, this is interesting and not very well studied, but, you know, um, anecdotally, when I've talked to people who have recovered from anorexia, a lot of people, you know, many but not everybody will tell me that they just actually have learned to eat the same thing every day. They eat the same foods, they eat the same amounts, they don't eat intuitively, uh, but they've learned that, you know, you know, they've got great self-discipline, they just kind of force themselves to kind of eat enough and, you know, eat the same kind of foods to maintain their weight and, and not get into trouble again. So, you know, I, I think this is a very kind of understudied, kind of area, but, you know, we're trying to l learn from the biology here, you know, uh, you know, how to kind of better approach this. And it may be that for some people that recover, that might be the best strategy is to, is, you know, is to just eat a kind of very structured kind of meals every day. And, and that may not, and for other people, that may not be true. There, you know, there may be other kind of approaches. Uh, even though these are relatively similar kinds of disorders, you know, the, the reality is that if you take a hundred people with anorexia, you know, they're they're going to have a hundred different types of kind of symptoms too, and and response to treatment. So it's you know, it's it's a bit more complicated than you know, maybe I'm portraying here, but. 
I think to, to answer the listener's question about when should their child have full responsibility for their own intake, I think what the method that we use is to gradually um, have the child take on more control of their intake. For instance, if they're choosing, the, if they're in charge of their evening snack every night and they're successful with it, then we'll have them be in charge of two snacks and doing it gradually. Um, the, uh, our, in our clinic, um, for most families, the parents remain uh, either in control or, or largely helping their child to get the nutrition they need until their child's fully able to do it. Thank you both for addressing that. Um, one attendee is, is wondering if you're accepting any participants for your current studies. If so, how can they find out more information about that? That is a great question. So we are always um, yeah. um, participants for our studies. We study people who both currently have an eating disorder. We're currently recruiting for bulimia. Um, anorexia recruitment will happen a little bit uh, no, actually, we're still we're still looking for people to recover too from anorexia. You know, if people uh, want to just send me an email and say that they're interested. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to get them in touch with our research staff. We'd be delighted to uh, uh, consider you. People can live anywhere. We can, you know, often fly people in. So, if you would visit our Facebook page um, yeah. at the SD Eating Disorder Center, um, we also post our recent studies up there regularly. They're on our website as well. Um, and yes, we're looking for people both with current eating disorders and people who've recovered. Yeah. And what is your website again, um, Dr. Parks? It's um, eatingdisorders.ucsd.edu. Great, thank you. And then the last question for this evening is, um, what do you hope to see in the direction of research for neurobiology and eating disorders in the future? Well, I, you know, personally, I like to see a cure. I mean, that is, uh, you know, really effective treatments where people, you know, are not ill for many years and they, you know, quickly recover. And, uh, you know, it's probably only going to be when we understand the mechanisms underlying these uh, problems uh, that will develop that. And I would like to add, um, I really hope that this research that we're doing at UCSD and with our collaborators around the globe that more people start to think about eating disorders as brain disorders so that we can continue to reduce the stigma um, and increase people's access to care. Very well said. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Kay and Dr. Parks for being with us and for your presentation on neurobiology and eating disorders. And thank you to everyone for attending our webinar this evening. If you have Thank any you. Other questions, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Just to let our participants know that if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us at info at eatingdisorderhope.com. And once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar as well. And um, Dr. Parks and Dr. K, is there a contact for any individuals who are interested in following up um, on your presentation this evening? Yes. Um, so they can go to our website, eatingdisorders.ucsd.edu. Um, they can also call our clinic directly. Um, and they'll just be directed to the right department, depending on if they're interested in treatment or research or any of our training programs. The phone number is area code 858-534-8019. Um, and they can also email me directly. I'm at E for Aaron, my last name Parks, E Parks at ucsd.edu. Um, and you can also email me at wkaye at ucsd.edu. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so very much again for your time and for this wonderful presentation. All right. Well, thank you for allowing us to do this. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. And on behalf of Eating Disorder Hope and Dr. Walter Kay, thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy your evening. Good night, everyone. Good night.